today, I, I mean, it's really hard to choose what to share, but I wanted to make a contribution to the club by, um, by showing you that what you see matters. Every encounter each one of you has with a mushroom or a fungus is super important. The fact that you coincide with a mushroom doesn't mean anybody else coincides with the same mushroom. And it doesn't necessarily mean that anybody else has ever coincided with that species before in history. So it's really important to, to acknowledge to yourselves that the mushrooms you coincide with are important, they matter, and, um, and you have the possibility of following a procedure that I'm gonna teach you today, and your encounter can matter for science. So I'm gonna share my screen, and we're gonna do a step-by-step. -step. Okay, you'll let me know, Ben, if, do you see the screen? All good? I see the screen. Perfect, okay. So, um, oh, hold on, let me see if I can make the move. Okay, so the first thing we need to define is the goal of our collecting. Are we collecting to eat? Or are we collecting to voucher a species for science? To document a find? If, if I, um, so th this, the reason I chose this is from my experience, um, over two decades of experience working for the fungi and with people who collect. And sometimes I'll, I'll get an email with, you know, five incredible photographs of a species that's very special. And, you know, the first thing I'll ask is, can you send me the sample? And 99% of the time, the answer is, I didn't take a sample. And so therefore, uh, you're left with great pictures of a species or a specimen that you think is new to science in many cases or at least new maybe to that region or to a country but with no way to verify that no way to describe it no way to make sure it's new and no way to really make sure of the of the of the mushroom's identity because we do um, identification either through microscopy like or through molecular uh, molecular analysis of the specimen in both cases you need the physical mushroom fresh or dry so um it, this is why we're, we're going through these steps so if you define that your aim for collecting is to eat we can go around you know and cut the fungus cut the, the mushroom um, as shown in, in, in the specimen that's in the, in the forefront of the photograph at the, at the front, you know, we, and as most of you probably do, when you're foraying for food, you know, you will find a porcini, you know, you, you, you can, you cut it, you'll clean it in, in the field, you know, make sure, brush off any, any soil and put it in your, in your basket. But when you're collecting um, for science, you, you, the procedure is different. So if you're collecting for food, um, there are several rules for, for that collection to be done in a sustainable way. The mushroom exists to produce and to disperse spores. And the function of the spore is for the fungus to reproduce sexually. What does that mean? It means that the spores carry genetic material that um, that uh, it, it comes from one individual, but it has to meet another compatible spore from a different individual, and they both need to um, uh, produce their primary hyphae. They will quote unquote mate or pair, and they will produce a mycelium. So. What's happening there essentially is that there's genetic recombination. It's like us. We reproduce sexually um, uh, in, in, in most cases. And um, what's happening there is that you're getting genes from both parents. Okay. So why does that happen? It has to do with adaptation. So in the measure that you're recombining genetically, you're able to um, adapt to environmental and other 
um, conditions easier than if you're cloning where you're all the same, you know, always the same and, and you don't really have a chance to, to modify any aspect of, of, of a being um, to respond to environmental changes. So it's important to let species um, reproduce sexually and therefore don't collect all the mushrooms when they're very, very small. Let some reach maturity and sporulate and hopefully harvest them after they've sporulated, okay? Um, another um, uh, step for a sustainable harvest or a regenerative harvest of wild edible fungi is to uh, use a knife if possible. Don't yank them out of the soil because when you yank them out, you're, you're disrupting the mycelium. You, you are, um, normally if you yank out, uh, you know, a porcini or a, a bolete, it will come out with, you know, a good portion of soil attached to the, to the mycelium at the base of the stipe. So we want to avoid that uh, when we're harvesting for food because we're harvesting lots and lots of, of, um, of mushrooms of the same species normally. So use a knife, um, cut them and clean them in the field, right where you've harvested them. Make sure that all the remnants of any um, mycelium or any parts of the, of the fungus that you don't want to eat remain there so that there's a possibility of asexual reproduction, i.e. cloning. So you can clone a mushroom, from any part of its, um, of its body. Mushrooms don't have, and fungi don't have real tissue. So if we use the word tissue, if I use it, it, it's easier to use it. I want to make sure that you know that they don't have um, real tissue like plants and animals do. If we did a cross section of a porcini and looked at the microscope, all we would see a hyphae, just as we see in the mycelium. And the only part that's different in the case of porcini are the pores, and in the case of a mushroom with lamellae, it's the lamellae. That's the only part that's substantially different. The rest is all um, hyphae, so uh, linear microscopic filaments, okay, one cell wall thick. So we want to make sure that they remain in the field, everything we clean off a mushroom, um, so that that um, that my, those hyphae can reproduce, reestablish, okay? Carrying the, the mushrooms and the, fungi, the fungi in baskets is, is mandatory, I would say. It's fundamental when you're harvesting a lot of specimens to eat. Um, the basket allows for spore dispersal. Um, if you're putting them in plastic bags or closed containment containers, um, the spores will not be able to be dispersed and um, therefore the mushroom will have less chance of reproducing sexually, okay? Other suggestions for harvest, when harvesting sustainably for food is, of course, never collect a mushroom or any fungus that you don't know who it is. You, it, it's a very, very simple. If you're not 100% sure of the identity of a, of a mushroom, don't eat it. Um, if you're 100% sure that it's edible, only eat it. And if there's a little chance that it may not be edible, don't risk it. Um, never collect all of them. Never collect all the, um, the, the carpophores or sporums or all the mushrooms. Leave some, leave some to reproduce and leave some for the rest, for whoever may come behind you and may also want to harvest. Um, that's something important to do. And as I said before, carry them in a suitable way, not only to allow for spore dispersal, but also so that you don't lose your harvest. Because if you pile them one on top of the other, um, you know, in, in, it, without aeration, you'll probably get home with a lovely, you know, not maybe not lovely, actually, with a really stinky soup of, you know, squished you know, mushrooms that you won't eat anyway. So, so make sure to treat them with care after they're harvested. Um, it's super important to clean them before putting them in the basket if you don't want to be munching on soil. And if you're okay with munching on soil, then you can just skip that recommendation. <laughs> now, to get to the topic of this talk, we're going to talk about how to collect for science so that people like myself, who work in fungariums, who curate fungariums, can help you um, know for certain what fungus you encountered 
whether it's well known, whether it's special that it was there, or even whether it's new to science. And believe me, in my experience, there are many species new to science that citizen scientists overlook. And it has to do with the fact that they don't value the, the magic of their coincidence and they don't collect. So um, I recommend you all get out paper and pen. Um, I know this will be up um, on YouTube for a while, but we're gonna go through some steps that, uh, that may be useful for you to, to um, take notes on. So if I'm walking, you know, I'm walking around in the forest um, with my basket and all my collecting gear, gear and I see a mushroom or a fungus, not all fungi are, are mushrooms, right? So it could be a puffball, it could be a bird's nest, you know, an earth star, whichever the case. The first thing one does is to look at it. Don't touch it yet. Um, take your time, look at the mushroom, and start taking photographs of the specimen in its natural habitat. What does that mean? Hopefully, from far away first, and get your um, frame closer and closer into the mushroom. So without touching it, without disturbing or trying to clean the shot, first take a photograph from far away from what you're seeing uh, and start moving in, you know, get down on your knees or on your belly and take a photograph from, from the side. And most importantly, um, be sure to use a size reference. Now, why do I say this? In the case of this um, fungus, which is a beautiful Leotia, um, with this photograph, I have no chance. I mean, I have no reference of the size. But as soon as I put a size reference in, you realize the dimension. So this could be huge. It could be the size of a, of a bolete, but really it's, you know, five centimeters tall. And unless you have a size reference, um, you'll never be able to, um, to know that. Now, I don't recommend using lens caps because there are different diameter lenses. Um, in some cases, a coin is better. And this is a, you know, a Chilean 100 peso coin. If I hadn't used that coin, I would have no way of knowing the size of this, um, of this Montagnea arenaria, it's a desert fungus, but you realize it's very, very small. This is the size, this is smaller than a quarter, US quarter. It's bigger, it's like a five cent <laughs> coin probably. Um, so make sure to use a size reference that's, um, that's standardized. I normally use my hand, um, but my mother uh, said to me many years ago, she said, you, you do realize that, you know, hands shrink with age. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, make sure, you know, I change that. And I started using coins and just lost so many that um, st I'm sticking to the hand. Um, but, but you, because you always carry it and you can't leave it in the field. But carry something if you can, you know, even a ruler and make sure that you get the, those field shots with a size reference. It's incredible how much you go back to these. There are some mushroom knives that actually have uh, rulers on them. Exactly, there are specialized mushroom knives that have rulers on them and there are field guides. So for example, I've written um, several field guides and in, in my case, what I do is that I include a ruler, you know, on, in the book. So be, make sure if, if you have a, a field guide, check if they have a ruler or, or, um, or if your knife has a ruler as well. Now, with, with um, time and specialization, one evolves in how to use the size reference. And in my case, um, for many year, years, I used the system that you see here on the screen, which is a label that has a bar. That, that black bar is two centimeters wide and three millimeters tall, okay? Um, and, and so I know that I have a size reference on the label. The label also has the location, it has the number of a sample, and it has the date. It has my initials, GF, because I'm the person who's collecting. And I'll get back to this later in the, in the presentation, but this is, a, this is a more evolved way of doing scientific collecting when you're really not even looking for edibles at all, okay? Um, the second step is to gather the data. Um, the data are super important. Um, 
you, as I, as I mentioned, when you're collecting systematically, it's important that every sample has its own number or name. So if I collect, you know, an agaricus, uh, the first agaricus, I will say zero one GF. So Juliana Fucci zero one. Maybe I'll do twenty twenty. The second agaricus I encounter will be zero two. Even if it's the same species and it's in a different place, it will be zero two. Never repeat the number. And it's very important because once you've dried specimens, sometimes they all look really alike. And unless that number is there, you have no way of relating the dried sample to the field photographs or to, or, you know, or, or to anything you've taken. So the best thing to do is to designate a name or number, make sure that that's in the photograph as well um, with the size reference and the number. If you can, most phones have them, um, get a GPS coordinate. If you don't have, you know, just get a, a, a coordinate, um, a location coordinate. Um, write down the location. So it could be, you know, a South Slope, you know, Colorado Springs, five meters from a gas station. It, I mean, it can be like that. Just, you know, something that will, that will get you back to where you found the mushroom. Write down what it's growing on, soil, wood, um, burnt wood, tree, standing live tree trunk, uh, standing dead tree, um, stump, and anything you can, anything that, that you see um, of that substrate that, that you can write down. It's important to write down what vegetation and what trees are around your find. So if you can identify that there's an aspen or that there's, you know, a birch tree or there's an oak, write it down. If you realize that it's in a, it's in a habitat where it's full of trees, there's mostly this tree and I don't know what it is, get, grab a leaf, put it inside your notebook, you know, stick it next to the number of the, of the mushroom you found. Smell the mushroom um, without touching it yet. Still, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't touched it. Um, you know, get on your knees, um, smell. Uh, most people smell, you know, just by taking one, as we say in England, a whiff, like, okay, I recommend smelling like a dog. So go, you know, you get a better sense, you know, do a little dog sniff uh, on the mushroom. Um, no judgment when in the field, you know, if you see somebody sniffing like a dog, don't say anything. It really helps a lot, you know, write down, um, what smells you might appreciate. Um, the texture, is it fragile? Is it sturdy? What can you see, you know, without touching it yet? Um, uh, and, and, and is it fragile? Is it, does it look firm? I mean, in mycology, poetry is not only allowed, it's desired. So, uh, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, slippery, but smooth and firm and, or, or, you know, or, or anything you can appreciate there, there are, there are times when one encounters a, a mushroom and one says, you know, it's elegant, it's elegant. And, and, and everybody will see it, will say, oh, wow, that's elegant. So write down elegant, you know, or, or you know, uh, um, and any, any word that you could, that comes to mind immediately. Um, does it have any stains on it? Is there something characteristic? That's important and we'll get back to stains now. Um, after writing all that down and getting these field photographs from, you know, a, a, a wide angle narrowing into, you know, a, a macro shot, hopefully, um, we proceed to collect the mushroom. Um, this is a blast from the past. This is, I, I'm in this photo, I'm collecting a a giant puffball in um, in Patagonia in Torres del Paine in the year 2001, believe it or not. It's either 2000 or 2001. Um, so that's a, a big blast from the past. It was so windy that I had to cover up my basket because the wind would blow the mushrooms out. So if you realize there's duct tape, you know, and then like just a piece of plastic on top of the basket to prevent all my specimens from being blown away and all the work loss. So, 
sometimes one can use a little spade um, depending on on um, on on the habitat I, I think it's always useful to have a little spade with you when you're collecting um, a knife um, a hand lens as as many of you know um, there are different types of hand lens lenses but it's always good to have a hand lens with you um, a good field knife um, to collect, you can either use wax paper bags, um, you know, aluminum foil or, or a tackle box. For scientific collection, tackle boxes are really useful uh, because they, um, they have the compartments that um, prevent the samples from mixing together. And also you can, you know, put a few leaves inside and make a little moss or leaf bed for your sample inside the compartments of the tackle box. And there are different tackle boxes. The best ones in my experience are the ones that have removable separate separators. So you can adapt the size of, of the compartment depending on what, you know, fungi you find. So um, it's always good to have some of these with you and you can put them in the basket as well. But when we're collecting for science, we're not worry, as worried about um, spore dispersal as we are when we're harvesting for food. Because when we're harvesting for food, we're collecting most of what we see of that edible species. When we're collecting for science, we'll see in, um, shortly, um, the, the criteria for the number of collections or the number of specimens you collect is different. So with, a, with a, a spade or with a knife, um, gently unearth the fungus. We will not cut, okay? When we're, when, we're, when we're collecting for science, we have to make sure that we get the base of the mushroom with the collection. We will not clean anything um, in the field, okay? So you unearth the, the, the specimen. Um, sometimes, I mean, I personally use my knife mostly if I'm not carrying a spade. So you'll be careful to, to not go, you know, horizontally into the soil, which will probably, you know, cut your stipe in two, it always happens. But, you know, go in vertically and try to, you know, slowly um, uh, move around to, to loosen the whole, um, a sporum, the whole mushroom or fruit body. I don't like saying fruit body because fruits are for plants, but um, un unearth, unearth it um, gently. And while you're doing so, are there new data that start appearing? Does it smell different? Does the smell come out? Does it automatically just like boom, collapse? Uh, you know, um, does it stay firm? Does it stain where I've touched it? Um, do insects fly out? You know, there are so many things that can happen. Make sure to write down or to register uh, everything that's happening at the moment you unearth um, the, the specimen. Um, when you were in the process of, of collecting a specimen, you can't always unearth them like in the photograph in the lower right hand side because they're in wood like this, you know, the laughing Jim, the Gymnopolis that's, that's um, on the right side, on the upper right side. Um, and therefore, th there's no chance to get to the base of the stipe when it's, you know, 30 centimeters in the middle of a tree trunk. So in that case, it's allowed, you're allowed to cut because you have no other choice. Um, but once you do that, in the field, make sure to take photographs um, showing features, for example, how the gills or lamellae uh, reach the stipe, which is super important in taxonomy to use field guides. Um, one of the biggest um, features, uh, uh, macromorphological features, is how the lamellae or the gills reach the stipe. Do they touch the stipe? Do they touch the stipe and then run down, decur down? Do they not touch the stipe? Are they free? So for example, in the case of Amanita, all Amanitas have free lamellae. The lamellae don't touch the stipe, okay? Apart from the fact that they have white spores and other features. But there are some genera um, of, of, of fungi that, that, um, that with that feature um, will narrow down the possibilities of who it might be. 
Um, and there are features like the margin of the pileus of the cap. So in the case of the of um, the gymnopolis on the on the upper left hand, upper left, yeah, I don't know if I got them right or wrong before, but the gymnopolis is the orange one. <laughs> um, um, you can see that there are remnants uh, of a veil or like a, a membrane on, on the edges of, of the cap. And those may be lost in the transport from the field to the home or to the cabin or to the tent or wherever you're you know, working with your specimens. And that's why it's important to take these photographs in the field. And there are, and there are species that are very small and that even dry out before, you know, just in the car ride to get back home. So it's important to take these photographs right there when you found them, okay? Spe many species change color when they dry out as well, and that's called their hygrophonus. So, as I mentioned before, how many? So when I'm, for when I'm foraging for food, I tend to want to get the most number of mushrooms or, or porcini. Um, you know, one has to be generous and one has to be sustainable and regenerative, and it's always important to leave some Leave some for the animals who eat them, leave some for the mushroom to sporulate and disperse, and leave some for whoever's coming behind you who wants to eat some as well. Um, but when you're collecting for scientific um, reasons, you don't need to collect everything you see. And you want to collect what you've photographed. Um, so for example, if I'm in a patch of the forest, you know, and I've seen this mushroom, um, and I did the whole process of photography that I just explained, but then I collect ones that are, you know, 10 feet away. That's not recommendable. Collect the ones you photograph that have the number on them, that have a size reference. And how many do I collect? Sometimes there aren't many. Um, my colleagues normally say one is nothing, two is something, three is a collection, start of a collection. But most mycologists won't even stop to photograph or collect a species that there's only one specimen, unless you're certain it's really special or, or it's a big wood conch where you normally don't find many. So you'd want at least three um, uh, for that to be a collection that will have enough material to do microscopy, molecular work, and to leave a voucher you know, for history because we mustn't forget that the reason we're collecting, we're collecting because we want to know who it is and we want to voucher our encounter with that species. And in a while, I'll show you what we do with what we voucher. But so if there are many, so, it, you know, if it's like all Caprinus, you know, little Caprinus and there are, you know, 20 of them, you can collect, you know, six to dry, um, add on another three that you'll be using for, for the next step of cutting and, and photographing, and you can take some for a spore print. Okay, so uh, in no case you need 20, but one is really insufficient unless it's a conch or, you know, something very special. Um, when you have specimens that are very, very small and you don't have a tackle box, um, it's important to put them in, you know, either a wax paper black bag or a little closed pouch from wax paper. But be careful when using, if you're going to use al aluminum, I know that in the US you say aluminum, but we say aluminum, um, aluminum paper, because the metal, um, when it's, you know, um, um, how do you say, when it's folded up, can sometimes scratch and mark um, the mushrooms. Okay, so be careful with that. Collect, put them separately in somewhere. Um, uh, you can make pouches from aluminium, you can make pouches from wax, wax paper, and you know, put them somewhere where you can um, uh, keep them separate. Um, and I very much like um, making moss or leaf beds with my specimens, and that's because the moisture of the leaves or of the moss um, keep the, um, the specimens fresh. So I have a bigger chance of seeing more features when I get back to, to a tent or a cabin. Now, the photograph I'm showing here is not, uh, the reason it's here is that it, when people say, you know, use a moss bed, 
in my experience, a lot of people tend to do this that's in the photograph and they'll just make, you know, one giant moss bed and put all the specimens there. But one trip in the field, you trip once and, and there's no good field foray without at least one fall. Um, you, you've, they're all mixed and most of them are broken and the moss is everywhere. So as I said before, try to make the moss beds inside the tackle boxes. And just, you know, you can even cover the mushroom with a leaf and, and make sure that it remains, you know, moist. And then when you finally get back, you know, to your, oh, oh sorry, one very important thing is the number you use to identify, the number or name that you use to identify your fungus in the field has to go into the bag or the tackle box with the specimen. Never separate the number or the, um, um the label from the specimen that it belongs to because it's very hard later to match which was which so you get back home and you have to move on to the next step which is taking technical photographs and many of you may see um, photographs like these in um in field guides um, or in you know scientific papers or you know posts or, or you know these sites like mushroom observer or, or iNaturalist or others um, so the important thing is to have a monochromatic background what does that mean one color ideally that it, it doesn't not shiny can't be shiny because otherwise you just get shine of your camera or the flash or whatever you need to use um, and place the mushroom um, on that on that, um, you know, I normally use um, fabric, so a non-glossy non fabric, either gray or black. And, um, you know, you put a ruler down, the same label you had, if the label got wet in the rain or from the mushroom, write it out again, exactly the same. Um, and put it next to the, to, the, um, to the mushroom and take pictures from below, from above, get details of the lamellae, um, do a section, a, longitud a longitud longitudinal section. So here's, here's another example, you know, one way, the other way, you know, you get uh, details of the annulus, of the margin. Do a section, a longitudinal section, I'm sorry, I can't say the word, like in this case, because here what we, what we are seeing very clearly are characteristics that are important to ID the specimen. Here we very clearly see that in this case, for example, the gills or lamellae don't touch the stipe. The stipe is hollow. Yeah, it, has a, it has a hollow canal inside. We will be able to see the type of bulbous base that the specimen has, you know, the shape of the base. So if I were collecting these for food, I would have cut off the base and I would be missing very, very important information that leads me to the ID of this specimen. Okay, so the label is in all the photographs, sections, one side, the other. Um, if there, is, there are very big differences in size between what you've collected, place the smaller ones, the larger ones, make sure you show, you know, the, the, the diversity of, of, of sizes or even color um, uh, from your collection. Many times you can't get um, the label in focus to get the edge of a large mushroom in focus, but then move your focus and make sure you have one blurred label and then one blurred mushroom, but it's the same frame, the same shot. And make sure in your technical photography to capture any detail that may be curious. So for example, in this case, in this Amanita muscaria, it's been eaten probably by a snail or a slug, but there are clear bite marks. And I, I want to make sure that I get that also in my shot, okay? Um, here's another case where you see very clearly, you can move the ruler around, you can move the label around, but here in this photograph, I see the top of the, of the cap, I see the side, you know, I see the margin, and I see an open section of um, the lamelle, the stipe, you know, the base of the stipe and, and um, the details of the flesh, okay? Sometimes they are tiny and you only have one, uh, but you know it's something different and special. So you go through the same um, steps, but, um, you know, first 
the entire uh, mushroom, you know, put it on the side, and then finally you cut to get the details of underneath, um, underneath the, the cap. Okay, and then in that case, to, and then we move on to a spore print. The spore print is pretty straightforward. Um, uh, most of you probably know how to do it. We have a mushroom. Um, we cut the, the stipe off and we place the cap of the mushroom on a piece of paper, um, hopefully half white, half black, because if it's on a white piece of paper and it has white spores, you won't be able to see them. Uh, and if it's black spored on black paper, you won't see them either. Um, when you do this, uh, the only reason to take a spore print is to be able to use field guides that classify their specimens, first of all, from spore color. I recommend for people that are starting in mycology um, to do spore prints, but later on, you can use a hand lens and you can see the spores many times deposited either on the annulus or the ring or on um, the straight, you know, you can even touch the, the lamellae, the gills, and you'll, you'll get spores on your finger. In the case you do a spore print, keep the stipe and keep the cap afterwards and always put the label with the specimen, even next to the spore print, okay? And there they are. This is exactly what I was saying. So the reason we use half black or half white paper um, is pretty clear here. No explanation needed. Um, but it's hard to see white spores on white paper. But not only mushrooms with a lamellae, so cap and, cap and stipe um, mushrooms, release spores. You know, gelatinous fungi also release spores. So, you know, in, before I would, for small specimens, take spore prints directly on a, on a slide, on a microscopic slide, microscope slide, um, because it was easier, you know, they're small, but you can see that these jellies leave a white spore print. Um, and, you know, if, if you have um, trouble with space or humidity of the paper, you can always take spore prints directly on a glass slide. Uh, and then keep them. Um, spore prints are possible from different um, different types of uh, fungal um, spore producing bodies or fruit bodies as some people call them. Um, but all of them have spores. So in the case of, of, of the cup fungus, you know, many of us, you know, have fun, you know, blowing them or clapping next to them so that they'll release all their spores. You don't want to do that if you're collecting for science. You don't want to have a, a you know, a sporeless specimen. We need the spores for microscopy. So you have to um, collect them delicately and, um, and, and try, you know, try to put them in something that's closed so that when they sporulate, you can see the spores. Um, you know, in the tackle box section or, or something else. In the case of the puffballs, there's no need to take a spore print of a puffball. I mean, it's pretty clear the color of the spores there. But you do want to make sure when collecting um, puffballs that they are mature or semi-mature. Because if you get a, a very, very new, young puffball um, and, and collect it, it won't mature enough to, to, to produce spores even. And, and, we, and it's desirable for there to be spores um, in your specimen, to, to be able to look at them in the microscope. Coral fungi also release spores like the jelly fungus before. You can place them on a piece of paper and, um, and the next day you'll have a silhouette in spores. And of course, earth stars are like puff balls. You can just puff a bit out and see what, what color the spores are. So this is what a typical, you know, rented cabin in the field looks like. You use everything you've got to cover up the specimen so that the wind doesn't blow the spores around. If you can tell, the label is with every single one. Um, I can't stress enough how important it is to keep that label with its specimen because really later they all look the same in many cases and you won't know which one is which and, and all your work is lost. So um, overnight, leave them covered up. Um, sometimes, you know, the ones in the middle there, there weren't enough mugs or, or, or glasses, you know, use whatever you can to cover them up so that, the, so that they're not, um, the, so that the spore print is deposited, you know, well deposited on the paper. And then 
comes um, the probably the most important step, which is drying and storing. So um, depending on where you're foraying is whether you have one of these or not, right? The infamous food dehydrator that is ideal for drying specimens, okay? Not everybody, certainly not myself, um, forays where there's electricity. So you won't be dragging this around if you're only gonna stop you know, in a cabin for two days, which is the case of this photograph. The rest is dried with silica gel, which are you know, the silica beads that come in little pouches, sometimes with food or with sneakers, or you can buy it in bulk. Um, and there's a silica that changes color when it's wet, and then you can recharge it. You can dry it out and use it again. Okay, so when you're in, you know, if I'm in deep Patagonia, I would probably carry more um, silica, um, but I would definitely not be carrying this around because there's no way to power it. In this case, we stopped in a place with electricity and there was a little heater. So drying, it's important not to cook the mushrooms, please. You have to put them either in a paper bag, um, uh, uh, after the spore print is taken, or after you have all the data, or even the you know the wax paper bag, or make a little paper pouch, the label inside with the specimen, and then a duplicate of the label outside, and um, place them close to a source of heat and air, warm air. Um, I don't know Ben if you can help me, but it should not be more than. 35 to 40 degrees centigrade is the temperature um, to dry uh, your specimens. Over 40 degrees centigrade, you can you degrade the DNA, and it's not it, it's not ideal. That's 140 Celsius is 104 Fahrenheit, so that's okay. between around 86 to 100 degrees ish. Yeah. Between eight, thank you very much. Between 84, 86, and 100 degrees Fahrenheit, um, but not directly on the heat source with air, with that warm air drying out the specimen. Um, that normally takes, depending on the size of the specimen, it can take anywhere between one night to, to two days. Um, but I can't stress how important it is to dry them well. If you don't dry them well, and pack them, they will rot. If you, um, if you don't dry them well and put them you know, in, a, in a Ziploc bag you know, uh, to keep them, they will rot in there and you will have lost everything you've done that we've been walking through. So the drying is, is important. It, you can use a bit of silica gel and put it inside the bag with a dried specimen just to make sure that that will absorb extra um, humidity, the silica will not interact with your specimen unless you're using used silica that may have remnants of another mushroom. Never, you know, if you're going to reuse the silica, you, you can put the specimen in the bag and you put the bag in the silica. So the silica will not be contaminated with spores or little bits of lamelle or bits of, you know, the cap of the mushroom, but the silica will be absorbing through the paper, okay? Um, and then you can recharge and reuse that silica gel. It's very heavy and, it, and it's, not, it's, not, um, it's not very expensive, but it, 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 it's something that you want to look after. So we leave them drying um, overnight or one or two nights. Um, before you leave the next day to go to the field, you have to you know, check your specimens if they're dry, um, store them, and I'll, I'll show how we store them um, in a bit. And, um, and then you start your day. If they're not dry, you can leave the dehydrator on, uh, making sure that it's not more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? And when they're finally dry, um, you have a specimen inside a bag with a label that's the same label that's on the field photograph that you took, that's the same label that's on the technical photographs that you took, and then it's the same label that will be, you know, on, on the bag. Um, and ideally, that label should contain this information. The number, the specimen or sample number, who collected it, 
the person who identified it, so for example, say uh, Brian and I, Brian Brazi and I are out, you know, in Colorado Springs and I collect a mushroom and he says, oh, that's, you know, um, Belitis edulis, then I will write down that he, you know, he is the person who gave me that name, um, the location, the coordinates, what it was growing on and the date it was collected. So above where it says specimen or sample um, number, you can write a species name and the number, but bo both, both, both things should be on, okay? And um, this is the final step that will allow you to, excuse me, have, I just brought out one box from the Fungarium here. I don't know if, if anybody can see, I'm gonna do this, I hope, um, ooh, this smells lovely. Um, but here you can see, for example, hundreds of specimens. Okay, I'm gonna pull one out that, let me get the first one so I know where it goes back, that have been collected. Do you see they have? Juliana, could you stop the uh, presentation for a minute so we get you full screen again? Yeah, I'm just gonna, I think that was the last slide anyway. Oh, so perfect. Um, there it was. Um, so perfect. here I am. Okay, so here, what you can see in this, so this is one of the boxes of the FFCL fungarium. And we have 2000 specimens stored. But if you see our specimens, you see the dried fungus, you see the label. That label is the same label, it has the same number as the field photograph. I have a fungarium number and that will, so you can deposit your specimen later, for example, you can go to the Denver Botanic Garden and go to the fungarium and give Andy Wilson your specimen that's correctly vouchered with the photographs and he will he will um, put it into the fungarium with this other label. And in this case, I make sure they stay dry with the silica gel. Can you see the silica gel, those beads? These beads go blue when wet, okay? So I know that they're red, I mean my specimen is dry. This is indicating silica, just to make sure that it doesn't rot. The fungus, it has its label, and then it has the fungarium label. And, and so, um, any one of these that I get out, you'll see the same thing. There's my collecting label, what I've showed you. It has all the information. It has the dried mushroom. Um, uh, this one has indicating silica that has absorbed a bit of humidity, but it's keeping my fungus dry. Um, when you can't separate a sample from, uh, for example, ooh, what was there? Oh, okay, it wasn't me, um, sorry. Um, you, when you can't separate the sample, for example, from a twig, you collect the whole twig, you know, with the, with the fungus attached to it, with its labeling. So sometimes, like in this case, it's a fungus that grows on a leaf and it's tiny. It's a tiny leaf with the fungus on it. You still collect it, as you see here, it has a label with the number, that's the same number that's in the photograph, in the field photograph, in the technical photographs, in my dried bag, and then in my specimen. So those are basically um, the absolute fundamentals of collecting for science. I can take any one of these samples um, to Kew Gardens, you know, to, to New York Botanic Garden, to Denver Botanic Garden. If I have the photographs and the sample collected the way I've just taught you, your encounter mattered for science. And if you don't do it like that, it's just an anecdote of something special that was photographed, but that was never collected.